We're ready to restart. So we have seen that in order to know B's MAC address, A had sent an NDP network solicitation packet or ARP request packet that was responded to by A. Now the question might be, do you do that whenever you have one IP packet to send? Of course, that would be a bit sub very suboptimal. So what is done by all systems is to have a cache. In IPv6, it's called a neighbor cache. In IPv4, it's called the ARP table. And in most software, even for IPv6, sometimes they continue to call it ARP table. So A will keep uh, the MAC address of B in its table so that whenever A has a packet to send to B, it will not need to redo this. Like everything I said before, this is also soft state. In the sense, this is uh, stateless in the sense that this is not hard coded in A, and the way to provide this is to have a timeout. So, if A sends a packet to B once, and that's the end of the story, after a number of minutes, this cache will expire. And if A has to send a new packet to this address, it will have to ask again for the IP address, which makes sense because, in particular, if the addresses are given by uh, DHCP, it may be that if A and B have not been seeing each other for a few hours, perhaps B is no longer B. The IP address that the machine has is not the one that is not the same B as when A spoke to that machine some time ago. So the MAC address may have changed also. So for that, you have a timer. Of course, you optimize again by when the timer expires, you have to send a query again and you try to avoid this whenever you have indication that the binding, the correspondence between the IP address and the MAC address is still valid, then you don't need to uh, send a query. How can you verify that the binding is correct or is still valid? How can A know that this mapping of the two are the same? In other words, that this guy, this IP address, has not changed its MAC address? Well, this is typically done by watching the source addresses. Whenever A receives a packet from B, it looks at both the IP source address and the MAC source address, if, they are, uh, if B, B is known to be a neighbor of A on the same network. If it's always the same MAC address, then that is considered as a refreshing and the timer is restarted. So in practice, if A and B talks more than once every 20 minutes together, uh, you never do ARP unless one of the two machines reboots. The ARP, I said ARP, I should have said uh, NDP. Uh, the NDP network uh, discovery protocol packets, uh, network advertisement network solicitation packets, are carried as ICMP packets. ICMP stands for Internet Control Messaging Protocol. It is a protocol that sits directly in IP packets, so it doesn't use TCP, doesn't use UDP, and it is used for this kind of things. It is used for the management of the IP layer itself. Here is an example. I want to know uh, how to reach this IP address, so I use uh, ICMP. This is used also more famously for uh, error codes. If you try to reach uh, a machine that is not reachable, then some routers might respond with an error code saying host unreachable, and this is also uh, an ICMP packet. ICMP has this protocol number. Uh, there's an ICMP v6, doesn't mean it's the sixth version of ICMP, but it's the version of ICMP that goes with IPv6, the one that manages IPv6. So there is ICMP v4 and ICMP v6, which is visible here if we see if we do a pretty print of the packet capture, we will see that this is an IP packet and that the type is uh, IPv ICMP v6, not uh, TCP or UDP. And you will find here uh, all the content because this software understands ICMP and can know that, for example, the field mean a target IP address. With IPv4, Everything is the same, except for the terminology. Uh, the protocol is called ARP, Address Resolution Protocol. As I mentioned, is, that term is often used also for IPv6, but this is formally not correct. 
Um, a minor difference is that our packets are not IP packets. So that's an example where IP uses non-IP packets. Uh, they are packets of a higher layer, they are carried inside Ethernet frames, and they have a protocol of their own, which is called ARP. So inside the Ethernet packet, there is a protocol type, and called an Ether type, which is ARP. This is a testimony of the fact that when this was developed, IP was just one protocol out of many. It was an inter-networking protocol. So machines that had IP were, for example, Macintoshes that used IP to interconnect to a non-Macintosh or a non-Apple device. For example, if you want to get data from an IBM mainframe, you would use TCP IP to interconnect the two worlds. So, and the, there was a, the address resolution protocol was meant to be able to serve a variety of network layer protocol, not just IP. So it's a protocol of its own that exists uh, in isolation. Uh, but this is purely artificial today. In practice, ARP is used only for IPv4. But that explains why if we look at an ARP packet, we will see an Ethernet header, and then in the Ethernet header, we will see type ARP, and this is uh, what is contained here. This is a bit ugly. I mean, to, if you would redo it today, you would do like we do with IPv6. You would put an ICMP packet inside an IPv4 packet. At the end of the day, it makes little difference. Right. Okay, a uh, quick question for your vigilance. The correct answer is B. Of course, the trick here is not so much about ARP, but whom are you sending to? So the router is sending the packet to this guy. So it needs the MAC address of the next hop, not the MAC address of the destination. If you analyze, I mean, this is EPFL, so you, you know the prefix length. So those are the green and the red are different subnets. This is not a bridge here. So this gun is sending an ARP for the MAC address that corresponds to the IP address of this interface, 128, 178, 156.1. So the guy who will respond is this guy, or the eight, sorry, 182.5. So the, it's IN, INR that will respond with its own MAC address, which is this one. So the correct address, the correct answer is, is B. Right. So we see that MAC addresses are really local. Uh, the MAC address of this guy, for example, is in principle not visible to the rest of the world. Except if we use EUI, if we embed it in the IP address, which is one of the concerns that people have with this way of embedding the addresses. So somebody asked the question about uh, security. Uh, of course, all of this is completely insecure. This is. Uh, how the internet was developed. The internet was developed in a world where security was not a concern, or security was only, we were afraid that the Soviet Union would destroy us, was the kind of concerns we had, but there's very little you can do about it, so uh, for the rest, we lived in a happy world where we could leave the doors open, and uh, la Suisse de grand-père. Uh, but uh, that doesn't exist anymore. Of course, the, the internet is full of pirates of all kinds. Uh, still, local, local threats are much less important than global threats, right? In order to infiltrate a land, if you need to be physically in the place where the systems are, uh, the attack is, of course, much more difficult to do and less important than if you can attack a system from anywhere in the world. Nonetheless, uh, this is not very secure. For example, if you manage to capture the ARP or the NA, NDP NA packets, you can respond with your own address. And if you respond with your own address, uh, then A will send everything to you. So if, you're, if your business is to mount a man-in-the-middle attack of some kind, uh, that's a very good thing. So how can you do it? Uh, Typically, this is what is done today. Uh, first, in, um, in, uh, in many places, nothing is done. So if you go at home in your place, the only thing you need to do is to have the password of the uh, Wi-Fi access point. Once you have the password, uh, there is no verification 
uh, of, the, uh, of the MAC addresses. In enterprise networks, typically, the Ethernet concentrators, which are normally switches, will uh, remember the mappings between IP address and MAC address. They will remember them. Sometimes uh, they might even be the source of these mappings. So if the box to which you are connected knows what is your MAC address, then there's no reason to do ARP. Right? If somebody needs your MAC address, you ask the box. You ask the Ethernet concentrator instead of asking me. So if you look at those things, I've, on purpose, I've drawn the Ethernet as if it would be a shared cable, which is not the case today physically, but is in the mental model of all the protocols we have in the MAC layer today. So if it's a shared uh, medium, that's fine. If there is a box in the middle, if A is connected to a box and C to a box, if C needs to know what is the MAC address of A, you can ask the box for what is the MAC address. So this is, if you do that, this is called DHCP snooping. There's no change to ARP itself. All the hosts continue to do the same thing, but the Ethernet concentrators, when it sees an ARP request or an NDP NANS packet, it will not forward it to the solicited node multicast address. Anyhow, multicast is very clumsy to support, so it will intercept that and will read the packet and give its own answer to it. And since the answer is under the control of a box that is normally secured, you will get a secure answer. This is one of the solutions that is uh, typically used. There is another solution which is more futuristic and uh, has been attempted. It's called Secure NDP, or SEND. And the idea here is to make NDP spoofing uh, radically impossible by using uh, signature schemes. So the idea is that every host has a public-private key pair. What, what is that? I guess all of you took a cryptography course, right? No? Who, who can explain what is a, a private public uh, key pair? Yes? Okay, exactly. So encryption is a magic uh, silver bullet of computer networking and computer in general that allows to have security. With encryption, you know, the normal way of encryption is called symmetric key encryption. You need a secret key to encrypt. So if I have a message, I look at the, I take the key, I use the key as a parameter in the encryption mechanism, I obtain an encrypted text, and to decrypt it, I need the secret key. That is the easy, simple way to understand of cryptography. But the magic of a public-private key pair is that it's possible to have two keys, one used in one part, encryption, for example, and the other in decryption, and one of the two can be public, while the other is secret. And the knowledge of the public key is, if it's large enough, makes and the scheme is secure, is impossible other than by trying all possible private keys. It's impossible to guess the private key from the public key. Right. So it's a bit magical. It's based on number theory originally with RSA uh, more than uh, about 25 years ago. And now there are other techniques, but RSA is still used. You need fairly large keys, 2,000 bits with RSA, and it's fairly uh, compute intensive. So encryption and decryption, it takes an uh, order of millisecond or more. Uh, but it has this magic property that, for example, as you said, if the, one of the key is public, that means anybody uh, can verify. If I want to sign a message, I will write the message, sign it somehow with my private key, and anybody can verify with a public key that it was correctly signed by me. So that's for authentication. For encryption, you can do uh, the other way around. If I have, um, I can encrypt, I, I can uh, encrypt with a public key, and then I know that only the guys who have the private key can read the message. 
So if I want to send a secret message, once it's encrypted with a public key, nobody can decrypt it except if you have the private key. So it can be used in both ways. That's very powerful, and this is how the secure internet works today. It's used in all certificates, uh, for example, with additional building blocks. So here, uh, if we assume that every host has one such thing, you can create them uh, fairly easily. Uh, you can create a public-private key pair. So B has both a public and a private key. Normally, your, private, your public key is put in what is called a certificate. But here, you don't even need uh, a certificate. And then you create the host part of B as what is called uh, cryptographically assigned address, CGA, which is simply a hash of the public key and the IP address prefix. And this means that uh, if the key is long enough and if the uh, crypto system is not broken, it's impossible to forge. So somebody that gives me this EUI must have, uh, I cannot reproduce this EUI unless I have uh, the private key. So this is a way to bind the IP address and the public key, and in particular, only somebody who has the private key is able to have made uh, this address here. Now, when uh, an ARP uh, request or a network advertisement message is sent, uh, so this is B here that has this address, and it responds with its own address, then it will sign its address with its private key. So A is able to verify the signature by using the public key. The public key of B, as the name indicates, is available somewhere on a web server. You can uh, find what is the public key. So A will be certain that, of one thing, it will be certain that this ARP reply, this NA, network advertisement, has been sent by a system that owns the private key because only this one uh, is able to provide the signature that I can verify. Now, does it prove uh, who this guy is? We don't know. I mean, this uh, just means this guy is the private key. But it certainly it means that if I have an authenticated uh, uh, mechanism to know that this IP address is really the IP address that I want to talk to, then I can be certain that I'm talking to somebody who has the private key that corresponds to it. So typically, this is complemented by certificate systems where you can, in addition, verify the identity of, for example, the service that you're getting. You're talking to a bank. Is it really the bank that you're talking to? This will not solve the problem. Uh, you will need for that uh, certificates. But here, it will make it possible for an attacker to send a reply because the reply with his own address would need to be signed and uh, it, this guy will not be able to have the private key. Right? So that solves the problem, uh, but it's not widespread yet. Um, and one of the reasons it's not widespread is very illustrative of the problems with the low layers and security in, in the internet, is that this has been defined and uh, proposed as RFCs, uh, um, uh, standard track document in the ITF. Um, however, this is Mac layer stuff. So Mac layer stuff is typically implemented in, in the hardware. And the problem with that is if you need to change, if you need to patch the, for example, the hash function, which is exactly what has happened here. The, in security, the problem is what is secure today might not be secure tomorrow. If Arjen Lenstra finds a way to break the hash that is used here, all of a sudden the world knows how to forge collisions, and therefore this is no longer secure. And in security, there's never proof that something is secure. It's proven as long as the academic community has not broken it. So, and when it's broken, you patch it, you change it. There are lots of cryptographic means. You can make the key larger, or you can use another hash, cryptographic hash, or uh, asymmetric crypto system. But if you need to do that, you need to change the system. So cryptography is very comfortable when it's in the application layer. When YouTube changes your YouTube video app, uh, they can change the, the crypto system at the, every week. They change it every week on your smartphone. Right? Uh, if you have to change the low level, the 
NDP software, it's a patch of your operating system, right? which perhaps is also every week, but perhaps on uh, printers or things like this is, is not every week here. So anyhow, this is the, the one that is in a uh, secure NDP is using a hash function, which is today considered unsafe. So the ITF has to redo it, redefine it in another way, and, uh, and, the, and the companies will have to implement it. Now, let me skip this one. Well, that's all about, uh, about ARP. Uh, we can think of ARP as a nuisance in some sense. If we, if we think of how networks are built today, and if we would build it from scratch, probably we would not do ARP, because when you have a network today, you access it typically over Wi-Fi, cellular network, or over an Ethernet switch. In any case, when you connect to a network, you talk to a box to which you need to give a password or authenticate or do something. So that box knows everything about you. At least it knows your MAC address. So the normal place to ask for a MAC address is this box, not to broadcast things to you. But this is done in this way because at the origin, internet was a way to interconnect local air networks uh, that were shared medium ethernet. A few more words about what we find in the IP header. And uh, so this we've seen already. Uh, now, I'm interested in one field that is called hop limit, or in the old time it was called TTL. So, if you look at uh, packet capture, it will be called TTL for IPv4 and hop limit for IPv6. TTM means time to live. When the internet was created, it was really a time to live. So, it was a timeout for the life of a packet. When a host created a packet, it put a lifetime in it to say in 30 seconds this packet must have been delivered or must be dead. And every router was asked to count how much time the packet spent in the router and decrement the time. Of course, that was done in the 70s uh, when routers were routing packets at 10 or 20 kilobits per second. Uh, now we don't do that today. What the router does is decrement the field by minus one. So it decrement by one. So do you don't count how much time you spend in a router. That would be way too much work uh, to do it for every packet. So it's called time to leave, but it really is an integer counter, which is more properly called hop limit. And the way it works is, uh, so why does it exist first? Well, the main reason is explained here, is to uh, mitigate the nasty, the side effects of loops. In the internet, in principle, there is no loop. There, there are loops in the topology because the internet is highly meshed. But in the forwarding rules, in the paths that are taken by packets, there should be no loop. If a packet is caught in a loop, it's a deadlock. It will stay there forever and will never be delivered. So you need a mechanism to kill it if it's never delivered. Right? And the problem is that if you, depending on the bandwidth delay product, if you take a system that has a small latency and a large bandwidth delay and a very small bandwidth delay product, this is what happens if there's a loop between A and B. So here I'm showing a packet being transmitting from A to B, and there's a loop, so it goes back to A, right? If the transmission time is large compared to the propagation time, you see that the single packet can occupy this link for, for all, forever if there's no way to kill it. So loops are, of course, a problem for the packets that are caught in the loop, but they're a problem for, everything, for everyone. If there is a, routing a small routing problem somewhere in the internet, you can have looping packets that are extremely efficient mechanisms to do denial of service attacks. You busy the links, and then this link is down with one single packet here. So you need to have a way to kill it. Of course, the best way is to avoid loops, but it's impossible to entirely avoid them at all times. Well, what is the reason? Why aren't we able, with all the intelligence we have and all the machines and all the artificial intelligence that we are created, why can't we totally avoid loops? Because the network is evolving. Yes, that's the first half of the answer. And the second answer is because anything we do takes a non-zero time. If you modify something in a network, 
you need to modify the routing tables, it is impossible to do it exactly at the same time everywhere. In order to do it, you need to have a protocol, you need to have a distributed system, which we will discuss, that's the routing protocol. Even if you have very sophisticated routing protocols that do consensus and this and that, you cannot guarantee that at exactly the same nanosecond, the change will be in effect everywhere because there is propagation and processing time. Processing time we can accelerate by making things faster and faster and faster, but propagation time is given by nature. We, we can't do anything against it. So there will always be transient periods in the reconfiguration of a network where things are not totally consistent. Before a change packets were going there, after the change they are going here, and in between some of the routing tables here have been updated, but there they are not and you cannot totally avoid the loops. We'll see examples of this when we look at traces of what happens in the updates of a routing protocol. So to avoid this, to mitigate this, we cannot avoid it, but to mitigate this, we use the TTL, which is an 8-bit field, so between 0 and 255, that is decremented at every hop. When it reaches 0, the packet is dead. So it's the life, if you want, like in uh, virtual life, you know, when you have so many lives, when you reach zero, you're dead. By default at source, it's 64. Some systems put 60. So 64 means it's an upper bound, we think, on the diameter of the internet today. The internet became, went public, let's say, in 95 in Windows, for example. Before Windows 95, there was no TCP IP in Windows. You, you had to patch special uh, programs to do TCP IP. The first version of Windows that had uh, TCP IP natively was Windows 95. And when they announced it and did big demos here in Europe, it didn't work. They, they couldn't reach Microsoft server because the Microsoft server were in the US and they had put a TTL of 32. And at that time, the internet was much deeper than now. I think now with 32 hops, it would probably work to the US, but at that time it did not work. And so they could not reach uh, the demo server. They had tested all the demo, it worked in the US, but when you would export it to some places in Europe, it didn't work because of the TTL. So Microsoft has learned since now to put 64 as a default, and the ITF is monitoring this, and uh, we believe 64 today is more than we will ever need. We've seen, in fact, the use of TTL. TTL is used by programs like TraceRoute or TraceRT that try to guess what is a route between a source and a destination. The way it works is uh, by sending a sequence of packets with increasing TTL. So if I send a packet to a given destination address, this one, which is www.google.com, one of the uh, Google servers, if I use this program, it will send a packet with TTL equal 1 first. What will happen to this packet? Unless you are working in a Google data center, you are more than one hop away from this destination. So this packet will be received by your router. The router will receive it. Now the rule of TTL say, a TTL 0 means packet dead. So if you are a router, you receive a packet that has TTL 1, and you have to forward it, then you kill it because you, the TTL0 would be a dead packet, so you kill it instead of forwarding it. And normally, not most routers, they are polite, when they kill a packet, they send an error message using ICMP back to the source. So the router will say, I'm sorry, I have killed your packet because TTL was too small. This is how the source, how the trace route program will discover the existence of this router. Then it will increment the TTL, send a packet with TTL equal 2. And if TTL equal 2 is not sufficient, the same thing will happen at a second hop on the path. And this, this is how we will discover. So this is the first router that complained, which is an EPFL router. The second is also an EPFL router. The third one as well. The fourth one is a switch router. So we have exited EPFL. We're on the switch backbone, and we see we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 switch routers. The sixth hop is an internet exchange point. This is where switch interconnects with other networks, in, probably in Geneva or Zurich. And then the other ones are Google routers. So here we've reached Google, but we're still several hops away from uh, the final destination.
So this is uh, how TTL can be used for us for, for debugging. Of course, we hope with that we get a snapshot of the path, but are we really sure? Pardon me? Yes, so it is possible. Sometimes you, you see that. If you see star everywhere, that means the packet was lost, but silently. Some routers do that. In particular, many company, IBM often does that. Google not, but IBM, yes. So some companies don't like, because it's a way also to, to do uh, attacks against routers, is to do denial of service by sending lots of packets that would cause the routers to send ICMP things. Now, doing an ICMP requires a lot more processing than simply forwarding a packet. Routers are optimized to forward packets. Uh, sending error messages is more costly. So some routers don't do it, but Google normally does it. So that might be a reason. There are other reasons, yes? The route can change in the meantime. The route can change in the meantime, exactly. Or even worse, there can be multiple paths. So it might be that the first packet, there are 10 different paths between me and Google, and each of those things takes randomly one of the 10. So the sequence I have, there's no guarantee, but it is a consistent path. So you just have to analyze. So the TTL is the main field. Um, if you look uh, with more detail, you will see there's lots of other fields. One of them, uh, we will come back to it when we talk about congestion control. Some of the bits are used here. And there are other fields that we'll talk in the module called IP3, which is also for fragmentation, for breaking packets into uh, smaller packets. I think we've done all of that. So I'll conclude with this uh, last quiz for today, for this module. I close in five seconds. And the correct answer is D. It cannot be forwarded by a router. But of course, bridges they are below the radar screen of the IP header. So we don't know what bridges can do. There can be 20 bridges on the path or zero bridge. In fact, as long as you analyze only what happens at the IP layer, you don't know. In fact, there are very few tools to know at all what happens in the bridge network. If you want to know how many bridges your packet go through, uh, it's quasi impossible with the standard tools that we use in the labs. You need uh, very specialized tools to do that. The bridges are transparent. Voilà, that's the last thing we will see about this part of the Mac layer. Are there questions on this? On the IP layer, sorry. If not, we talked about bridges and how they are transparent. Well, this is precisely the topic of the next module. Uh, the Mac layer, which is what we will study now. So this figure is illustrating the raison d'être, why there is a Mac layer. It is solving the spaghetti problem of cabling. When you go to the Internet Engineering Workshop, you see a very nicely organized room. You have the impression cabling is a very simple problem. But if at home you cable your own things with your TV monitor, your power supplies, everything, you quickly realize cabling is an issue, right? You have lots of wires everywhere. This is the problem that the Mac layer is really solving, sometimes in a radical way by being wireless. So we'll talk about uh, Ethernet and what I call the Ethernet myth because it is not the way Ethernet is today, but somehow it continues to shape the way protocols and even IETF engineers who 
continue to standardize protocol, continue to think and reason about the MAC layer. The MAC layer was invented um, at the end of the 70s, and, or, or yeah, 79 for Ethernet, I believe. And believe it or not, this is how it was at the beginning. So this is the first Ethernet network was a shared medium cable, a coax TV, a TV distribution uh, cable, on which you would put a big box, you drill a hole in it, and then you do a derivation and you connect your computer to it. So it was uh, low-tech kind of things. No, uh, here there's no active thing. You put a coax cable and this coax cable goes to all systems. So it's a true shared medium. Why people did this? Well, uh, at that time, that was a challenge. There were alternatives that were using telephone switches to connect several computers in the same campus. Now, several computers in a campus at that time would mean perhaps 10 computers. Right? You could use the telephone cables and have a central place to which you connect. But this was more fancy, and that has developed at uh, Xerox Park. Uh, and this is... Uh, it was called Ethernet. There were another competing system called Token Ring that was a bit different, but mentally uh, we could think of it as the same. Now, the idea was that when computers talk, they tend to be bursty. Most of the time they say nothing. Once in a while they transfer a block of data. And the burstiness of the traffic means it's more efficient to share the medium rather than have a dedicated link to a central point because this dedicated link most of the time is used very, very little. That was the thinking behind. As we will see, this thinking perhaps is still valid today, but this is not how cable network are organized today. But given this assumption, the problem was of collisions. If you put several computers on the same cable, and if A and B talk at the same time, because they both want to send to someone else, uh, at that time, that would cause a collision. Like if in this room, many people talk together, uh, we don't hear well. If you speak to information theory, uh, theory people or communication engineers today, they say, but we know how to handle that. We can use coding uh, to have several people talk together and be able to decode at the same time. And this is what is done in modern MAC layers that are CDMA, for example, in uh, 3G network. This is how they work. 4G as well with uh, different principles. At that time, this was not known. So what the only thing that people knew were mutual exclusion protocols. If you want to prevent, to allow this to work, you prevent collision by finding a protocol that will make sure only one person speaks at a time. Like in a room, if you want to speak, you raise your hand, I give you the word, and only one of you speaks at the time. This is a collision avoidance protocol. It's a MAC protocol for the audio channel in this room. This exists in a variety of forms. Originally, this is how Ethernet was. I say originally. You can still find a few systems, but you really need to go to very specialized uh, used sales uh, to find people who will sell hubs and systems that use shared medium Ethernet. We still have some in the Internet Engineering Workshop, but soon they will move to the Bolo Museum. So Ethernet use today really is not in that form, but a large number of other technologies are similar with lots of difference in details, but at, uh, at, uh, as a first approximation, they are very similar. For example, if you use power line communication, if you want to communicate using your electrical wires, you use a new version of Ethernet, if you want, which is, uh, for example, called Home Plug Mag or Home Plug AV. Various uh, versions exist, so this is classically used Today, if you want to watch TV at home with Swisscom, uh, they will provide you a box that connects to your power lines. And this is typically more efficient than Wi-Fi if, you're, if, for example, you have multiple stories in an apartment or a house. Uh, but the most popular Mac today is certainly Wi-Fi, which is very similar with a few complications that we will discuss uh, for some of them as far as they concern us with addresses. Uh, we will not discuss how Wi-Fi protocol avoids collision. That's uh, the topic of the wireless course. What we will say instead 
is give what is the prototype and the ancestor of all those protocols. Uh, it derives from ALOA. So what is ALOA? ALOA means hello in Hawaiian. And that was a research project did that, the, in fact, in parallel to the first internet uh, projects, where you have, imagine you have five islands, each of these boxes are different islands, and you have a mainframe here, and you have terminals on the remote islands that want to communicate with the mainframe. And you use radio for that. I will uh, stop on this slide. You use radio channel for that, so you have two wavelength, two uh, radio frequencies that you use, one for sending data and another one uh, for hacking the data from uh, the remote to the center. Voilà, I think we will stop for here and uh, we'll see the details of Aloha next week. <laughs>